So uh, good evening or good afternoon or good morning uh, to everybody. I'm Uli Bea, I'm university professor at New York University and the faculty director at the Center for the Humanities. And it's a great pleasure to welcome a group of distinguished scholars and also friends who I've known some of them for a very long time uh, who are joining us today um, to celebrate the publication of the Trials of Orpheus, Poetry, Science, and the Early Modern Sublime by Jenny Mann. So first of all, Jenny, congratulations on this book. And we're really thrilled that we're able to host this event today uh, with such a distinguished group of guests. Um, two technical notes, we're recording this meeting. We'll make it available at the NYU Center for the Humanities YouTube channel later. Um, Kyla Bowen, thank you so much for being the tech uh, and helping us get this all set up. And we're gonna get right into it. And um, Roland Green, who's professor at Stanford University and a longtime friend also, I'm really happy to see you. I'm gonna hand it over to you to introduce our distinguished panel. And I wanna just thank Lynn and um, Suman to come in and have this conversation of bringing us back. I think the Orphic theme is always some kind of return to hopefully, hopefully a, a better place. So uh, <laughs> Roland, uh, if you can come in and then uh, uh, of course people know how to use Zoom. So please put your questions or comments for Jenny or any of the other panelists in the Q&A. You can also use the chat as you're doing. We're happy to see so many of you. Um, and we're just thrilled to have this event, Jenny. It's really it's really wonderful that you're um, uh, choosing the Center for the Humanities to do one of your book launches. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Uli. And uh, it is really a delight to be able to join you today on the occasion of this book launch for Jenny Mann's uh, The Trials of Orpheus, Poetry, Science, and the Early Modern Sublime, which recently appeared from Princeton University Press. Um, in my role today as moderator, I'm going to introduce our speakers uh, who will share brief presentations with us, and then we'll have a discussion um, featuring questions from the panel and, and, and from the audience. Uh, I think what I'll do is first I will offer our author the chance to respond to the presentations, and I may have a question or two for her myself. And of course, we hope to entertain questions via the Q&A function on Zoom. And as Uli says, I'm sure you all know how it works, but you'll find the, the uh, button down at the bottom of your screen. So first, let me introduce our speakers, beginning with the author whose work we're celebrating. Uh, Jenny C. Mann is Associate Professor of English at New York University with a joint appointment in the Gallatin School of Individualized Study. She is a scholar of early modern English literature and culture, her research focuses on the relationship between rhetoric, natural philosophy, the history of sexuality, and literary expression in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, Jenny is the author of uh, 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 another celebrated book, Outlaw Rhetoric, Figuring Vernacular Eloquence in Shakespeare's England, which appeared in 2012. And she co-edited with Deba Priya Sarkar, a special issue of Philological Quarterly on imagining early modern scientific forms. Our second speaker, Lynn Enterline, is the Nancy Perot Chair of English at Vanderbilt University. Her research into early modern literature and culture investigates the connections among the histories of sexuality, rhetoric, and emotion in the English, Latin, Greek, and Italian traditions. Her scholarship has focused on melancholia, masculinity and poetic language, early modern classicism, Ovid, transgendered ventriloquism, Tudor pedagogical practices, literary production, and cultural critique. Lynn is the author of and editor of several books, including Shakespeare's Schoolroom, Rhetoric, Discipline, Emotion, which appeared in 2012, The Rhetoric of the Body, From Ovid to Shakespeare, uh, which appeared in 2000, and The Tears of Narcissus, Melancholia and Masculinity in Early Modern Writing, Stanford, uh, Stanford University Press book from 1995. She is currently working on a new project titled Epic Discontent on the Critical Potential of Passionate Character in Early Modern England. Uh, Lynn, it's a, it's a thrill to be on this uh, program with you and see you again. It's great and to finally, see you. Suman Seth is Marie Underhill Knoll Professor of the History of Science and chair in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. 
He works on the social, cultural, and intellectual history of science and medicine. His interests include the history of medicine, race, and colonialism, the physical sciences, particularly quantum theory, and gender and science. He is the author of Difference and Disease, Medicine, Race, and Locality in the 18th Century British Empire, which appeared from in 2018, and Crafting the Quantum, Arnold Sommerfeld and the Practice of Theory, 1890 to 1926, which appeared in 2010. He has served as the guest editor of a special issue of the journal Postcolonial Studies on Science, Colonialism, Postcolonialism, and a focus section of the journal ISIS on Relocating Race. He is co-editor of the journal OSIRIS. Professor Seth's current research looks at the history of medicine, race, and colonialism in the 18th and 19th century British Empire with particular emphasis on the history of seasoning, or as it came to be known in the 19th century, acclimation or acclim acclimatization. And so without further ado, let me turn it over to our featured author, Jenny Mann. Professor Mann, take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Roland, Simon, Lynn, Uli, and the Humanities Center. Um, and thank you to everyone who stepped away from your family this evening to, to hear us talk about the trials of Orpheus. Um, I'm just going to speak really quickly in a, about four and a half pages about the book and some of its big claims. Um, the project began with a single question. <clears throat> How do words produce action. It seems to have been almost universally acknowledged in the 16th century that eloquent language has the power to change the world. It can move people, create communities, destroy communities, make people believe things against their will, make good people bad, make bad people good. Early modern poetic theory often mobilizes these very same claims in order to defend the power of poetry in particular thus making the problem of how words produce action a literary as well as a rhetorical question. <clears throat> My first book titled Outlaw Rhetoric is a study of English attempts to translate the classical art of rhetoric into the vernacular. By the time I completed the research and writing of this book, my mind was completely saturated with confident assertions of the power and value of rhetoric. It will make you the emperor of men's minds. It will help secure an English empire. It will make your ideas and your culture irresistible. It will help you dominate barbarous people. It's a like, completely toxic <laughs> paradigm. Um, but I still wanted to know how, like how do such transformations happen? How are they achieved by verbal eloquence? What happens when an eloquent orator addresses an audience? Or at least what did early modern writers think was happening? In the beginning, for me, the Orpheus myth was simply a vehicle to this end. Um, it provided me with a means of accessing and understanding the interplays of rhetoric, poetry, and natural philosophy in Renaissance theories of eloquence. Um, but in the process of composition, the Orpheus myth slowly began to also become my method. And my term for this method is trial, a word that means to test or to try, also to prove by experiment, but that also means, as Ovid insists in the Metamorphoses, to rouse and incite. So the Latin word tempto means I test, I try, I attempt, but also I urge, I incite, I rouse, I handle, touch, feel the pulse. So borrowing from Ovid, trial is my term for both poetic production and also philosophical inquiry. And, and it's a term that acknowledges that to read and interpret a poem is also to participate in its effects. To touch an artwork is to, to be touched by it in return. Um, and now just to say a few things in summary of the argument. So the trials of Orpheus, poetry, science, and the early modern sublime investigates one of the most significant questions in the history of rhetoric and literary studies. And that is what constitutes the force of eloquence. Early modern writers drew upon pagan myth in their attempts to answer that question. And in so doing, they shaped fundamental principles of scientific knowledge with the figures of ancient poetry. 
In the Greek tradition, Orpheus is the first poet and one of the earliest embodiments of the idea of language as power. Orpheus's song is so ravishing that it moves the gods of the underworld and causes animals and trees to follow the singer. And um, in the kind of iconography of Orpheus, which I talk a great deal about in the first chapter of the book, particularly a series of Romano-British uh, mosaic images of Orpheus. He's often pictured surrounded by animals and there's always an animal in the picture who's trying to walk away and whose head is being pulled all the way back around to look back at Orpheus. And this sort of gesture sort of encapsulates the tension um, of the experience of being drawn by this power Powerful song. In describing this power of speech to draw and compel its audiences, Ovid's version of the Orpheus myth in his epic poem, The Metamorphoses, comes to provide English poets and philosophers with a vocabulary through which they can explain the capacities of eloquent language. Uh, my book recovers this experimental nature of the myth a myth that prompts these writers to conceive of eloquence as a force that acts at a distance, binding, drawing, softening, and scattering both audiences and poetic makers. So the early modern language arts, <clears throat> as I've already mentioned, vigorously assert the power of verbal eloquence to alter human behavior and prompt material change in the world. In keeping with these assertions, the discourses of rhetoric and poetics describe their own linguistic operations in terms of force, that is power, physical strength. But despite such confident assertions of the omnipotence of the eloquent orator poet, the qualities and operations of this force remain elusive. This is a longstanding tension in rhetorical theory. As the ancient sophist Gorgias declares in his defense of Helen, speech, he says, is a powerful ruler. Its substance is minute and invisible, but its achievements are superhuman. Renaissance humanists are keenly aware of the inverse relationship between eloquence's world-changing power and the secrecy of its operations. As the influential scholar Erasmus notes in the Adagia, verbal, verbal eloquence has a secret natural force, a kutam vim. As Erasmus suggests, the force of eloquence is a cultus or hidden, observable only in its effects. It cannot be seen with the eye or measured by any instrument. So how should the language arts represent these hidden powers? This practical dilemma indicates an even thornier epistemological problem, and that is how do you produce knowledge about forces that are invisible to human sense? Since its first appearance in the poetry of early Greece, the myth of Orpheus has provided a kind of answer to these questions. Though it might seem perverse to treat ancient myth as if it were a logical axiom or an experimental proof, in fact, the myth operates in precisely this fashion. It allows writers to conceptualize the invisible process whereby eloquent language persuades. And so my book is trying to, to argue that what might seem to a modern reader to be strictly literary inquiries into artful language are also reckoning with scientific conundrums, specifically that of action at a distance. 16th and 17th century natural philosophers are preoccupied with the problem of action at a distance, which is when an object is affected without physical contact, as in magnetic attraction. Uh, the Orpheus myth turns eloquence into a comparable object of knowledge for Renaissance science. The skilled orator must develop techniques that allow the practitioner like Orpheus to move audiences without physical contact. In this way, the art of rhetoric generates an idea of eloquence as a quasi-magnetic preternatural force, an idea that's widely adopted by poets and natural philosophers. Okay, so this is what I figured out first. <laughs> And as I tested and explored this idea, I became ever more persuaded that the classical language arts, rhetoric, poetics, serve an epistemological as well as a technical function in early modern culture. They theorize eloquence as well as training students in the art of persuasion. 
And the Orpheus myth is, is repeatedly cited in service of this agenda. However, the longer I spent with these materials, the more I realized that the status of the Orpheus myth within the language arts is hugely misleading if you're only reading rhetorical manuals and handbooks of poetry. And in fact, the presence, the heavy presence of the myth in these, in these documents can distract us from other aspects of its presence in early modern art. Ovid's tale of Orpheus asserts the formative power of verbal eloquence, to be sure, but it also insists that that song's power to remake the world cannot be disentangled from its own dissolution, as in the repeated failures of Orphic song to achieve its aims when he can't successfully bring Eurydice out of the underworld and when he's ultimately um, torn apart uh, by a band of Bacantes. Um, the force of eloquence consumes its own artifacts, audiences, instruments, and even at last its makers. Poets, 16th century poets, including most prominently Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare, are alive to the implications of this insight. These writers tune into the Orpheus myths, a marriage of creation and disintegration as the joint effects of verbal power. Moreover, they give the dissolving force of eloquence equal weight to its creative effects, using elements of the Orpheus myth to depict verbal eloquence as that which softens the body, makes audiences sexually wanton, and disorders political communities. So the mythos of Orpheus's song pulls early modern writers in two opposing directions. One is generative. That song secures the authority of the poet orator, allowing them to forge stable communities and transmit knowledge, dominate. <laughs> the other direction is dissolute. That song entices audiences to promiscuity and violence, ultimately scattering the body of the poet orator. Ovid's myth of Orpheus insists that these opposed motions, consolidation and disintegration, are twinned aspects of a larger story about how art operates in the world. This is a sublime vision of art, one characterized by domination, ravishment, and enthrallment. Each chapter of the book is organized around a key term that arises in Ovid's version of the Orpheus myth and is given new life in 16th century poetry. Like so many philosophers, poets, and playwrights, I put the Orpheus myth on trial testing and handling the story in much the same way that Orpheus himself produces his lyric harmonies by trying different chords with his thumb. And I should say, you know, this is, um, you know, a book by a kind of early modernist. It's for, for people who work with early modern materials, are interested in classical inheritance, the history of science, history of sexuality. But I think this book is also for, for anyone who wants to think about like what happens when you read a poem, <laughs> you know, what, what, what happens to you? And this is sort of my way of figuring this out through the materials that I know through in my research and teaching. Uh, so that's all I have. I'll hit it to Lynn. Okay. One second. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, oh, I'm at the end of my document. All right. Um, Okay, I want to start on a personal note. I first met Jenny when we were on a panel together at RSA, at an RSA conference in Venice. I remember being intrigued to meet a young assistant professor at Cornell, where she was at the time, which is where I'd gone to graduate school. But rather than talk about Cornell after the panel, Jenny told me she'd been one of my students at Yale. This puzzled me as I taught mostly small seminars and I didn't recognize her face or name. But then I realized she must've been in my Shakespeare lecture course where there were over hundred students in the class. And just before I had the chance to ask that, Jenny said, oh, I took your Ovid lecture course. I had to remind her that it was actually a course on Shakespeare's comedies and romances. And we both laughed, um, but her misremembering it as my Ovid lecture course tells you volumes about where Jenny's intellectual, uh, intellectual interests cross paths with my own. When I was teaching that lecture course, which my former colleague Richard Halpern called running the gauntlet, um, I was in the middle of writing my own book on the rhetoric of animation, uh, the failure of the voice and transgender ventriloquism as it passed from Ovid through Petrarch to Shakespeare. 
So uh, apparently it took a former student to point out or to remind me how much Ovid was dominating my thinking at the time. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me because to help launch a wonderful book and it grew out of many seeds, but I'm I have been delighted to discover that I, that I planted at least one of those years ago. And I did not know I'd done that. So in the trials of Orpheus, Jenny maps what some might think as of as familiar terrain, but she does it in surprising new ways. She puts the figure of Orpheus, ubiquitous, well-known, at the center of her an innovative and inspiring account of literary transmission, authorship, and the sometimes, sometimes subterranean history of the classical sublime. Now her book makes, it seems to me, it makes significant contributions to several vigorous fields of inquiry in early modern scholarship. One is when, when critics are rethinking the myriad connections between poetry and natural philosophy in the 16th century. A second is in which they are recovering the underestimated presence of ancient Greek thought in poetry in early modern England, long underestimated. And the uh, third, um, uh, in which scholars are revising conventional agential narratives of, about authorship and masculinity. And of course, The Trials of Orpheus is also a, a most welcome contribution to the lively field of Ovidian reception, which started to gain momentum to my mind about 30 years ago, and is still going strong. Um, it was inaugurated in early modern studies by such books as Leonard Barkin's The Gods Made Flesh, Jonathan Bates, Shakespeare and Ovid. And the momentum gained, gained steam um, in part because post-structuralism reignited interest in the history of rhetoric. And in part because feminists started asking how, we would, how do we assess the ubiquitous story of rape that recurs throughout the metamorphoses for Ovid, rape, or raptus, covers a range of meanings, going from the extremes of sexual violence to the sense of being ravished or carried off by aesthetic form. And he can go back and forth. In fact, he can wed them uh, in, in one story. Now, recently, some classicists called the past few years a new Ovidian age, um, which seems to be an accurate assessment, uh, both with respect to classical scholarship, but also to those working in medieval and early modern reception of Ovid's work. So, as you can guess, I'm mostly going to talk about Ovid in the, in the book. Um, and it, my comments really bear on that most uh, influential yet provocative of Latin poets, banished from Rome, known in the Renaissance as a virtual allegory for the political per perils of authorship, and only made a citizen of Rome again about four years ago, I think. They finally welcomed him back. Um, now, his... his uh, I guess Jenny might call it outlaw status, um, but this his provocative this provocative poet is someone that Heather James has wittily dubbed um, a kind of classical antibody. She's just put out a book as well. As I said, the field is is flourishing on um, Lycentia, Ovidian Lycentia, which for which he was exiled. And Lycentia means both sexual license and the rhetorical um, form of parasia or boldness of speech, and he, can, but he will combine both. In any case, it seems to me Jenny's book similarly offers an account of Ovid's Orpheus that challenges traditional views about literary adaptation and transmission, as well as, obviously, as she's just said, um, the consolidating account of rhetorical power passed on um, from, the, from the ancient world. Um, so as she puts it, Ovid's version of the Orpheus story frequently inspired early modern authors to suggest that such transmission can lead to the subjection of poets to their predecessors. To put it another way, um, classical transmission in the hands of those authors she studies engages with the Orpheus story in ways that suggest that the encounter with art's sublime power may have less to do with assertions of masculine control than a way of thinking about literary borrowing and revision as a mysteriously metaleptic process that can, and I'm quote, quoting here, overwhelm both poets and audiences with an ecstatic force. Now, I think the virtues of the, tri of the trials of Orpheus are many, <clears throat> not the least of which, excuse me, not the least of which is the sophistication and style with which Jenny writes. Um, and I, have, I must say, not all books about rhetoric are as eloquent as their topic. So the chapter titles alone to me indicate this is not the business of literary criticism as usual. T trying, binding, drawing, meandering, softening, and scattering. 
are the gerunds that track the complex legacy that the Orpheus legend unleashed in the world. One of the book's main argumentative strands, and I, there are several, is to distinguish between the claims rhetoricians made for the powers of words, the power of words to move audiences and provoke action, and Ovid's depiction of Orpheus's eloquence. Though he might well have been a ubiquitous ancient figure for rhetorical force, Ovid's version of the story also stresses how vulnerable the speaker may be to his own utterances. Um, so while learning, so while learning to aspire to vocal power themselves, 16th century Latin students encountered a poem in which they saw how badly words can misfire. Um, and this is not only in the Orpheus story, this is throughout the Metamorphoses, rendering even the most powerful poet vulnerable to unexpected forces. So um, Jenny's account of Orpheus makes him, uh, makes, I'm sorry, account of Orpheus makes him Ovid's chief case in point. Well, at first, and this is in the death of Orpheus, at first his voice is able to stop stones that are hurled by the Bacantes. Eventually the singer dies when their noise drowns him out. They are ululating and clamoring. Um, the stones hitting him in the mouth and falling to the ground, stained with the blood of the bard, his words unheard in recording. The poet's membra, which for Ovid means both body parts and clauses of sentences, lie scattered, drowned by Bacchic cacophony. So Jenny's readings throughout the book demonstrate that many of early modern authors who were educated on a steady diet of Roman literature and rhetoric that gave, um, in which Ovid was given a central place because of his wit and the sweetness of his style, that those authors paid as much attention to the poet's vulnerability to language as his mastery of it. So through 16th and 17th century, though 16th and 17th century humanist teachers were in the business of producing orators, or so they thought, um, whose eloquence would be instrumental, a tool their students could use to exercise a binding or civilizing force, many former schoolboys, particularly Marlowe, Shakespeare, and writers of a mo modern apelia, um, early modern Apelia, <laughs> found in the Orpheus story a different view of Enargea, rhetoric's occult power to move. The versions of Orpheus she pulls out from his, the, the web of that story tell us that they were interested in oratory's unexpected and sometimes perilous and sublime consequences as they were in its civilizing force. So read along such stories as that of Ovid's Ganymede, Semele, Actian, Medusa, Ovid's treatment of Orpheus carries within it a thinking about Enargea, alert to the extent to which it is possible for poets and audiences to be driven, driven to the limits of thought and expression. There are many moments in Ovid's poem that are sort of degree zeros of symbolization. So with regard to this, uh, the classical sublime that's implicit in the story of Orpheus that she's teasing out, Jenny draws attention to a passage from Two Gentlemen of Verona um, in which Proteus recommends poetry's power to woo or better yet, to move a beloved. And I'm quoting from the play now. For Orpheus's lute was strung with poet's sinews, whose golden touch could soften steel and stones, make tigers tame. So with respect to reading this passage, um, I would like to say one of the things that I most appreciate about, appreciate about her book is a technique I often think of as critical philology. She brings a philologist's very careful eye to bear at every turn in the book's pages. So with regard to the lute that is strung with a poet's own sinews, Jenny notes that sinew is a very likely, is very likely Shakespeare's attempt to translate the Latin noun nervus, which Ovid uses repeatedly for the strings of Orpheus's lute, as well as for Apollo's bowstring. Spanning a range of meanings, nervus could refer to obviously the string, but also to a fetter that is used to bind a prisoner to the stocks, and it could refer to a penis. And the, the, this association with the male member as Pat Parker demonstrated, um, connotes a kind of vigor, force or strength long associated with rhetorical power. So Shakespeare's line about Orpheus's lute, thus leads in at least two directions, making Orpheus at once the source of vigorous eloquence and as she writes, subject to its transformative power. The line she argues meanders dissolving the assumed masculine authority of the speaker by turning poetic force back on itself and its maker. Now, I can't go into depth here, limited time, but I'd like to say how much I admired her second chapter, Meandering, 
uh, for offering what she calls a transumptive theory of literary transmissions winding paths. It's subterranean um, movements, paths that may, like Daedalus's maze, overpower both artist and reader. And that is, can be very much the um, impression my kids always give when I, sorry, my students always tell me when they read the, the, the metamorphoses, they're not sure how they're gonna get out. So the meandering of poetic power back on its maker strikes me as a quintessentially Ovidian view of poetry. For example, the poet names his mind or intention in the very first line of the metamorphoses as animus. It's innova fert animus, my mind was turned to tell, or it really something along, I took it in my head one day, but anyway, it's animus. The noun animus and nouns animus and anima run throughout the poem, de designating either mind or soul, but they also inform the fantasy of words that are so power, they, powerful, they animate the inanimate. You can hear the animus in, the ter in our term. A fantasy that undergirds Orpheus's vocal power, as well as the story he tells of Pygmalion, whose prayer to Venus brings a statue to life. But the Latin nouns animus and anima derive from the Greek noun animos, which signifies the wind or breeze, whether internal or external to the body. So as the, an opening metaphor for poetic inspiration, and that's what he's calling for, breathe on these, my undertakings, this is my inspiration. This pneumatic etymology about the poet's mind, breath, voice, and song connotes powerful and invisible connection to the world. But the wind's force can be, only, can be harnessed only sometimes. It is never anyone's, any speakers to control and is traveling on its way elsewhere. Thus, when Orpheus dies in book 11, his anima or soul is exhaled on the air, and I'm quoting, and his lifeless or literally ex-animated tongue, lingua ex animis, murmurs a mournful song as his head floats down a river. It's one of among many figures in Ovid's poem that suggests that the narrator, however boastful some take him to be in the poem's closing lines, I disagree, but nonetheless, it's a boast, is vividly aware of his own connection to the many artists whose catastrophes he's narr he narrates. That's all I have. Uh, all right, rule for the future, never follow Lynn Enterline. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Um, I promise that I didn't do a PowerPoint slide only to share this tweet, but I can't promise that that wasn't a large chunk of the reasons that I did it. Um, I am just so happy to be here. Jenny is one of my very favorite scholars and so much more importantly, one of my very favorite people in the world. And reading her book took me back to a grad seminar we taught together, which tried to put uh, in conversation literary studies and science studies, um, a seminar which is just one of the absolute highlights of my teaching career. But let me stop gushing and get to work. Uh, when she asked if I'd comment on her book, Jenny specifically said that she wanted the history of science aspects of the book to be part of the conversation, and she asked what I thought of her, and I quote, spooky action at a distance BS. So I'm going to put my uh, history of science hat properly on my head. I've got three things I want to discuss, models and metaphors, music and poetry, and poetry and politics. So let me get to the action at a distance question. It's not, of course, BS. It is, as she notes, one of the three interrelated foci of the book, namely, quote, the conception of verbal energeia as a preternatural force that acts at a distance. Jenny has, to my mind, shown convincingly that those trying to solve the problem of poetry's efficacy drew explicitly on concepts and models from natural philosophy, the problem of magnetism, as action at a distance, for example. And I buy to the explanation of why they did so. Because magnetism, while obviously a great example of a cult action at a distance, also offered through the example of the chain of magnetized rings, a materialization of the occult that made tangible the force and action. A materialization that then turns the hidden into an open object of study, quote, converting an abstract idea of rhetorical power into a concrete image of physical connection. 
She shows too that this drawing of resources from natural philosophy is not a unidirectional action. If natural philosophy allows the poet to think through the problems posed by the Orphean myth, the Orphean myth helps Bacon, for example, to think through the problems of natural philosophy as he develops, quote, ideas of empiricism from figures of classical myth and poetry. Here's my question, however, the first of them. Magnetism clearly functions as a metaphor for the force of speech. Does it also function as a model? Now, this might be a confusing question. Models are a kind of metaphor, but models to my history of science eyes allow for not mere relation, they also function as heuristics. So Niels Bohr comparing atoms to a solar system meant that a whole series of questions we asked about planets, do they move in elliptical orbits? What happens when we introduce relativistic effects could now be asked of electrons and all that mathematical apparatus could now be shifted to the atomic problem. Did magnetism function in a similar way? Did questions we ask about magnets inform the questions poets asked about words? So to provide a very concrete question, but one of potentially many, magnets have polarity. They exhibit attraction, but also repulsion. Was this fact used as a means for thinking through problems in rhetoric? For example, how it was that certain speeches failed to appear. Indeed, could induce anger or irritation. Why does some speech repel? You could think of that solely as the failure to attract, or you could think of it as a polarity problem. Some attracts, some repels. How concretely and productively did poets think with natural philosophy? Models materialize. This is uh, James Clark Maxwell's model of a largely immaterial ether, but they're also manipulable and in their manipulations pose new problems. Now, I will say that I did not expect when starting to read the book to see the link between Orpheus and natural philosophy made the way it is by most of Jenny's actors. I actually thought the connection would be much more straightforward. Orpheus was a musician and music has been the object of natural philosophical study for absolutely ages. I thought we'd end up basically with a bunch of questions about harmony, resonance and sympathy. And we do definitely get some. So I'm quoting here, William Webb, 1589, eloquence and poetry being framed in such sweet measure of sentences and pleasant harmony. And yet many of Jenny's actors seem to resist this easy route, namely that poetry is basically music and we know that and how through harmony, for example, music quote, hath charms to soothe a savage breast, 1697. Thus it is, in the most amazing quote of the book, we've already heard about it, we have Shakespeare writing, Orpheus's lute was strung with poet sinews. Jenny returns to this line repeatedly, but does not note what to me is the most striking potential reading, that Orpheus, the poet musician, uh, the bard, one might note, to use a Celtic term, is thus rendered a poet only. Right? The music is gone and replaced with poetry alone. The music that has soothed beasts and defeated evil is in fact not music, not the lyre, but poetry. And it's worth noting the slide that happens repeatedly in the book as we move from a study of poet musicians to poet orators. Um, I will note my question, why is Shakespeare called the Bard of Avon when he doesn't play an instrument? Bard actually has a fairly technical meaning. I looked up the OED, I'm sure I'm wrong, but it tends to imply someone who plays an instrument, but post Shakespeare, it really seems not to. And even Jenny, I think captured by her actors will slide between what should I think be a focus on music and song Surely beasts aren't convinced by Orpheus's words, but by the music, 
to a reading of Orpheus's poet. And we can see it here. Uh, we're talking about his music and his song, but he's described repeatedly as a poet and only a poet. Now, why would this matter? Indulge me a little here because I want to try and offer a reading of Jenny's text as if it were history of science, with poetry just another kind of knowledge made by knowledge producers known as poets. So for this, let me briefly talk about a way that historians of science distinguish between two kinds of cultural history. We often distinguish between science in culture and science as culture. Now, science in culture is the most straightforward to most. We're thinking of the ways that scientists draw upon and contribute to a broader culture in formulating and disseminating scientific ideas. Lord Kelvin, for example, writing in his diary about the 102nd Psalm, the earth shall wax old like a garment, as he's thinking through what will become known as the law of entropy increase, the idea that everything decays eventually. Right, so a, a biblical resource to think through a physical problem. Right? Science as culture can be thought of in anthropological terms, the various cultures of science. Um, this is probably easiest done with an image. Look here at the iconography of a surgeon versus a physician, and you can spot clear cultural representations here. Um, if you want an example closer to home, check out the way that physicists on your campus talk and dress compared to how English profs talk and dress and you'll get two very different cultures of the academy. It's that second meaning of uh, culture that I wanna stress here because I'm gonna suggest that we see poet orators as one social group and poet musicians as another. And I'm gonna suggest further that those groups obviously were not always distinct. They're not distinct, I think, in Orpheus's figure. That, in fact, this is what I'm going to suggest, Renaissance poets like Shakespeare and others are attempting to distinguish a higher status kind of poet, the poet orator, from a lower status musician in much the same way that surgeons, for example, in the 14th century sought to break away from barber surgeons. So the question, is it feasible, do you think, to offer this kind of social reading for what Renaissance poets are up to? And second, what would evidence for this look like? And I'd suggest for the second, we might look at the social status of musicians in Shakespeare's plays compared to poets and orators and note that musicians tend to be lower status. So to restate that first question, what do you think of studying poetry as culture or better, the various cultures, which is to say social groups of poetry? As my last question, let me ask then about poetry in culture. Specifically, I want you to talk a bit more about the political context for these debates about poetry. So reading the chapter on softening, we get this line. Ovidian verse promises to civilize barbarous peoples, but it also threatens to effeminize poets and readers. I thought immediately of the parallel line from Horace. Captive Greece took captive her savage conqueror and brought the arts to rustic Latium. That line is from book two of the epistles written to Augustus. So that's a period, of course, when Roman poets quite explicitly plied their trade in service of a new empire. Virgil offering a new version of the Odyssey and Iliad that supplied a Roman history befitting an Augustan age. It's easy to see the English attempting to portray themselves as the new Romans, with Romans then standing in for the Greeks who bring the arts to a rustic military land. Yet your reading seems to tweak this, and ultimately this is my final question. In Horace's version, the Romans colonized Greece and are then softened by Greek arts. Colonization precedes softening. Yet if I read you correctly, say at the top of page 130, what's being argued here is that a softening via Orpheus comes first and is the means by which a different kind of colonization, one by oratory rather than arms, 
will produce a British empire. And so perhaps I can put it like this, is the Orphean empire for the English understood as a new kind of imperialism or is it merely the Roman empire redux? All right, I'll stop there. Thank you, Suman. And um, I'm about to invite Jenny to respond to briefly to the two presentations, but before I do, let me uh, invite our audience, which numbers about 70 people right now, to feel free to start submitting questions in the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, after Jenny responds, uh, I will um, attempt to uh, pose some of your questions to Jenny and, and, and hope we can get a conversation going. Um, and we will tr certainly try to get to as many questions as we can, but it would be great to have some uh, if, as they occur to you, you feel free to start putting them up right now. Jenny, let me turn it over to you because these two presentations were rich with um, mm -hmm. um, um, commentary on what might be imagined to be sort of the two sides of this project, the yeah. classical reception side and yeah. the, the natural philosophy side. So let me invite you to pick up your response yeah. to these two anywhere you want. Um. Thank you, it was wonderful to hear these presentations and to start to think about them. I'll start um, with a, a few responses to someone's questions, um, maybe not in the order in which you pose them. I mean, the, you're right to say that that Orpheus in my telling is being presented as a poet. And, and the, his status as a musician is sort of being suppressed. And in part, I'm following Ovid in this, who is uh, sort of claiming Orpheus and Orpheus's song specifically on behalf of the poet. I often say poet rhetor simply because um, early modern poetics is so super saturated with rhetorical theory and sort of comes to, particularly in the English context, which is what I know best, comes, of, comes to an awareness of itself as a system of knowledge by co-opting um, not only rhetoric's techniques, but its understanding of eloquence as persuasion that moves an audience. And so, so early modern poetic theory is often borrowing from that idea of eloquence's efficacy to move in defining its own sort of force and structure and, and operations. And so in a way I'm sort of that letting Ovid's um, theft of Orpheus on behalf of the poet from the musicians um, lead, lead the way. But, but also I do think that it's very important for the, uh, poets that I look at, Shakespeare and Marlowe, the writers of the Isopilia, that, that the scenes of Orphic song being produced in the Metamorphoses are emphasizing how that song is a passage through body liar, that, that, that there's a kind of, I think there's something about in, including the presence of the liar, the, the, the fingers touching the liar, the voice harm, harmonizing with that music to then produce this song that slows down enough to notice all of the mediating moments that constitute a song. And, and, and make it possible to think of the poet, not as the originator <laughs> of the song, but as an instrument it's passing through. You know, to Lynn's point about the kind of breath that, that, that uh, arrives. Now, the, there are plenty of other ways to think about powerful um, speech and powerful poetry in this period. But I think this version that you are the kind of medium or the vessel of a passage through your body as a kind of instrument um, hasn't been fully attended to in our kind of models of poetic production and literary theory in the period. And so in that, I guess that's kind of my, my defense of turning the musician into a poet because that 
transformation sort of helps us to notice the, 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 how singing is, is basically mediating the passage of a transfer of force rather than kind of creating it. Um, and um, so like, is Orpheus a way of tracking um, a kind of social group of poet musicians? Probably. <laughs> Um, I certainly haven't done that here. Um, uh, I think in part because I'm like interested in weirder versions of history and context that are like, that are like super time bendy. And I realize this is like an unsatisfactory answer, but it's not like this thick description of context where I'm thinking about like London and the theater. I'm actually thinking about, I think because this is how I experience this literature, the weirdness of an encounter with an ancient poem that becomes intimately a part of you and then you turn it into something else and it passes on. And so like, where are you and when are you when that happens? I don't know, but that's like part of the experience of, of um, making art uh, for those who kind of tune into this particular, particular um, Orphic model. And then the last thing, I do think it's a model. I think that's really helpful. The Orpheus story is, is a model. And um, I, I tend to call it a figure. I think because of my, my background in rhetorical theory and also just my investment in asserting that the language of rhetoric is a really powerful set of terms and concepts that I wish would be used outside of literary studies more kind of intentionally. And so, so I think that's probably why I hold on to figure as my term for the ways in which um, concepts get materialized. Um, but I do think model, model is good and would have done a, perhaps a better job speaking to an history of science audience. I will stop. <laughs> okay. Um, let me, um, first of all, I want to begin with a question about um, a kind of methodological question about the project. And it goes back to your, um, the term in the title, the trials of Orpheus. You mentioned this in passing in your opening of uh, uh, discussion about your choice of that term and yeah. what what the alternatives to it might have been. Yeah. I'm always interested in when a critic like you chooses one thing rather than another. If you could sort of, for the benefit, especially of the younger scholars listening, the graduate yeah. students, could you kind of rewind a little bit yeah. and tell us, take us back to your thought process when you were conceiving that term and the concepts that it embraces and sort of help us understand your choices? Yeah, so um, what a fun question. Um, I initially, the kind of my, my sort of pinhole into this is I wanted to write about softening. Mm -hmm. You know, long ago when I was a graduate student, I had worked on uh, this poem, Salmachus and her, uh, about uh, Salmachus and Hermaphroditus. And I was like interested in how the transformate, you know, the, the moment that Hermaphroditus um, uh, combines with Salmachus, it's experienced as a kind of softening. And, and, and then I had finished out law rhetoric and I still wanted to think about softening and like what kind of idea of the um, poetic event is it to, to, to think of that event as a moment of softening. And, and I was interested in it in part because it is not an, uh, it is a kind of complicated term. If what you want to say is poems are powerful, right? It, it's a little peculiar to say that they soft, soften audiences. It's not, it's a feminizing, it, it um, enforces a certain kind of passivity. And so I started trying to find little moments of softening um, in the archive to start to talk about what 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 this kind of tactile um, figure 
for um, an encounter uh, with eloquence was doing. And that's what led me to Pygmalion, the Pygmalion myth. And so then I thought, I want to write about Pygmalion. And, and, and there's a moment in um, Ovid's myth of Pygmalion, which is a song sung by Orpheus to the animals um, in book 10 of the Metamorphoses. And the moment that the statue comes to life in the poem, um, there's this kind of comparison to uh, a softening uh, figure in wax that change that kind of changes form, and so then I that was sort of my way in. So I wasn't interested in Orpheus at all. I wanted to think about this moment of enlivening and the artist's touch and the the, the softening of the statue, um, and then that's where I first saw this use of the the verb temptare, mm. which is like Pygmalion's touch. He's touching the statue. Yeah, <laughs> he is. It's awful. <laughs> and so, and so then I just thought, well, where else is that? You know, you know, you're just sitting with these at a desk with all of all of me, all of my different editions and translations, and like, I'm like, where else is this verb? And then I I saw it's there again, repeatedly in the Orpheus part of book 10 um, when he he goes to the underworld to to try to rescue Eurydice when he puts his fingers to the lyre and first tries to make his harmonious song and that was like the term for this moment of contact between the artist and artwork or artist and instrument and, and it gets translated all kinds of different ways in different editions of the Metamorphoses. But I started to feel like trial was this kind of powerful um, concept for thinking through the status of the kind of, of the Orphic poet who's touching things and also being touched buy things. And then, and then it kind of usefully evokes, of course, this all of these domains of thought from the religious to the scientific, this idea of experiment. But, but really, I mean, in Ovid, it's an incredibly eroticized, arousing um, experience. And initially, I think I wanted to call it Orpheus on trial. Um, and my, um, my, uh, wonderful advisor, former advisor, Jeff Masson said, I think it's the trials of Orpheus because it's, it's sort of multiple. So he sort of saved me and got me the final distance into, into keeping a sense of multiplicity around trial. That was, sorry, probably a long, overly long answer, but. No, it's great. Thank you. And not the first time that Jeff has retitled somebody's book. Um, so, um, <laughs> Uh, let me let me uh, shift over to some questions from the audience, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, try to quote them and and maybe paraphrase them a little bit. Here's one: Thank you for this fascinating discussion and the gift of the book, Jenny. Uh, it sounds, based on your summary of the project, like 16th and 17th century writers um, more or less affirmed poetic eloquence. Is this the case, or can you talk a little more about the cultural valences of this term yeah. in context? And however eloquence was valued, I wonder if you have thoughts about how we get from there to John Stuart Mill's 1833 opposition between poetry and eloquence, mm -hmm. which treats the latter as a threat following yeah. Bentham and Plato, or at least as a breach of lyric decorum. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a wonderful question. I mean, I, I think it depends on where you're looking. <laughs> um, and, and if you're for, if, if you're reading um, rhetorical manuals or handbooks of poetry or part of this, this kind of these general theories of language or lang works of language arts, there is this assertion of the kind of value and power of poetic element eloquence. It's, it's quite affirmative and it's like propagating this fantasy that you too can be the master of this power, if you submit to the demands of this discipline, then 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 you will have this this power for yourself, and it's it's um, it's pretty uncomplicated in its 
celebration, though, of course, if you read the manuals, you get all kinds of concerns about how this is really happening and how it's working in the world. But among the poets, I, I find it incredibly worried and conflicted. Um, and, and a lot of the um, allusions to Orpheus in like Shakespeare and, and Milton um, and so on are, are about the moment he's murdered. <laughs> And that's kind of, that's the, 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 the scene of the myth that gets obsessively returned to. And so, so the, the kind of, um, it's still valued, but in a way that is not particularly empowering and is in fact rather, rather, um, rather worrisome. But I think, I, I guess I think the absorption of rhetoric into poetics mm -hmm. in this period is largely to the advantage of, of poetics and, it, and, and that it, um, uh, you know, it, it is a kind of affirmation and that, that they're kind of happy to um, take on this vast ancient art and kind of use it to define what it means to make a poem in the period. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it occurs to me that the uh, that obsessive focus in the period on the death scene as yeah. sort of the standard reduction of the Orphic myth, does yeah. that have anything to do with the fact that his uh, his poetic production is kind of unrepresentable, right? Yeah. I mean, that is, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's we can talk about it, people can celebrate it, but you can't reproduce it at second hand uh, in a convincing yeah. way. I don't know. Maybe that's that might have something to do with, with the reduction of the myth. Um, let me, here's another question, uh, uh, quote, I wanted to hear you talk a little more about this proposition you made at the end of your opening words, that this is a book interested broadly in what happens to us when we read a poem. Could you talk a little more about how you've come to think about this after having written the book? I'm thinking about the affinities between your account and Louise Rosenblatt's account of the poem as event, mm -hmm. uh, within which the text both uh, stimulates the reader's attention and imagination, but also regulates it as a form of transaction. Yeah. What accounts of what happens in literary criticism theory do you resonate with the legacy of Orpheus? Or to put you less on the spot, how do you now describe to your own students what happens or what might happen during a literary encounter? How might attention to this help us articulate the virtues of literary study more broadly? Now, there's a question. Yeah, that's a Go great question. <laughs> I, you know, I think um, part of what was hard in writing this book is that our available language for literary influence is so problematic for the reasons we all know that there's this kind of patriarchal model of like the poetic fathers that influence their descendants and 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 a lot of our frames for describing like literary relations reinforce that model. And so I, I really wanted to find a way to talk about poems, touching poets, making poem, you know, to talk about that movement and those relations that are basically like what constitutes literary history that didn't simply re reproduce that kind of familial model of descent. And that also was open to like weirder nonlinear forms of connection. And so I started thinking about, you know, could we read Renaissance poetry as like documentation mm. of the encounters that people had with their own reading, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of what is often getting worked out in, in these in these artworks and and it's it's not it's influence but it's also sort of resonance um and a passage across and so that's um so so the my my book is trying to like use Ovid's myth of Orpheus to get some terms that could that that could help us see how this this particular quite charismatic group of writers in the 16th century um are 
are dealing with the fact that in order to write, you have to be a reader. <laughs> To make something happen, you have to let something happen to you. I totally aspire to being able to stage this in the classroom. I mean, that is my, my greatest dream to feel like, like something, like you read something, something happened to you. And how can we then account for it? Um, I don't know that I uh, am able to do that, but that is, is absolutely what I most want to happen in the classroom. And, um, and, and then also to just like follow these, these like weird little clues in the poems about the nature of that experience. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. That's that really, uh, uh, I think that that gets right to the spirit of that question. Uh, here's a question that um, comes from the audience, but I could have asked it because it, it sort of speaks for something I was wondering. Uh, the questioner says, and I'm quoting, I love, capital L-O-V-E, the account of poetry moving through breath as a form of mediation. My question is about the place of other listeners in this model. It reminds me of Astrophil and Stella, where the poet is inspired by his encounters with the beloved, breathing yeah. in Stella's sweetness. What are the ethics yeah. of this version of eloquence? Yeah. What models of poetic community does it sketch and foreclose and how should we judge them? I love this question. <clears throat> I've, I've thought about it a lot. I mean, I, um, you know, this happens, I think to all of us in our own work. At some point I got so caught up with this myth and my vision of it that, that I started to sort of identify with it. And, and, and at a certain point, I had to realize that although I'm drawn to this model of like Orphic transmission, Orphic literary transmission, because it's not this like patriarchal model of inheritance, but that doesn't mean it's great. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not that story about literary transmission, but it, it, it too has serious ethical problems. And I try to deal with this in my chapter um, titled Scattering, where I talk in particular about Titus Andronicus and the rape of Lucrece and the way in which in those works, Shakespeare links Orpheus with the body of the raped woman in order to suggest that eloquence and inspiration um, uh, kind of pass through or pass across this vulnerable body. And, and I think we see something important there about how poetic a production is being understood and it's not active and it mm -hmm. is passive. Um, but I don't think that this is a kind of ethical story about, um, you know, community or how we move others. It's horrifying in a different way, <laughs> I guess. And so I don't feel that I've resolved this to my own satisfaction. I think in part because I'm so, as you can probably tell, caught up in and compelled by like the beauty of this model of extremity that Orpheus embodies. But I, but I, I do kind of recognize that it's foreclosing other more hopeful less excruciating ideas about art and community. I think that's, yeah, thank you. Um, here's, a, here's another one, uh, taking us in a somewhat different direction. Uh, the book is lavishly and gorgeously illustrated. How did, you, how did your encounter with Roman material culture inform or even transform your thinking about Orpheus? Thank you. And that's thanks to, to Princeton University Press for kind of supporting um, the inclusion of these um, images. I mean, this initially, like I would, I, you know, in the early stages, I would want to go give a talk about Orpheus and I'd be looking for mm -hmm. pictures online, like, because I'm bad at this. Um, and, and I started finding these mosaics. Um, these mosaic images of Orpheus, and I found out that there are there was this absolute vogue in the production of of 
mosaics featuring Orpheus in the southwest of Britain in the fourth century. And so I just kind of wanted to know more. It didn't have any obvious historical connection to my project. Um, but I just wanted to learn about them. And, and I became fascinated by the borders of the, the mosaics and they're, they're kind of meander borders a meander as a line that has to travel backwards in order to move forwards. And, and, and I just started reading about mosaics. I was able to visit um, a wonderful museum in Sirencester called the Corinian Museum where I worked with a curator named Emma Stewart who, who kind of helped me look at these mosaics and examine their production and think about, and I think there was something about thinking about the figure of Orpheus in an entirely different medium that was really helpful for me in, in that moment for, for, for coming to a sharper sense of how the myth was functioning for me like theoretically. Um, but I also just really wanted to include that material in the book because I, I hadn't known it as an early modernist. I hadn't known about these mosaics. And, and, and it did kind of transform my idea of poetic transmission. And so I'm grateful it's in there. Great, thank you. Uh, Lynn, do you have a question? Am I, no, I'm not. Um, oh yes, it's sort of half formed. Um, I suppose, and it's probably springing from the question about ethics. Yeah. Because I've been, one of the threads of the book that we haven't really talked about is the erotic attraction yeah. of rhetoric. Um, and it's and, and of Orpheus' story, of his evident, he dies because um, among other things, he's a misogynist, yeah. right? In the, the Bacchae screaming, there is the man who scorned us. Mm -hmm. So um, the, this sort of um, agon between Orpheus and the Bacchae is both between cacophony on the one hand and beautiful music on the other, or a moving voice, shall we say. And also a, just a story about, about misogyny. And I, so I, A, I was thinking about that, and I was also thinking about your choices of which texts to look at, which authors. And um, I guess I just wanted to maybe just hear you say more about what impact besides just, ero just I shouldn't say just, eroticizing words is a way of saying they're very powerful. Yeah. But is there an ethical component to this, these poets' engagement with this story of they clearly knew, I mean, Ovid goes out of his way to say, misogynist, right? <laughs> like he, he won't, uh, uh, not only in the Orpheus story, but then again in the Pygmalion story, yeah, which is his own. So yeah. that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think all the time, like, is this, I mean, the, the, the reason, Orpheus is, is interesting is on the one hand, everybody is like, okay, here's the model for power, total power, mm -hmm. this guy. And then on the other hand, the, in the works of the, of poetry, it's like, this guy is actually, every time I think about him, I'm worried my body is going to be torn apart. And so it's actually this, this model of, of vulnerability and mm -hmm. passivity. And that, that doesn't track at all sort of normative ideas of masculinity mm -hmm. and assertion. And so the thing, you know, so what does it mean that a series of male poets like find their voice or, or have, have a voice pass through them that tracks this image or figure of like the abject, mm -hmm. um, male body and and is that posture or that position available to other kinds of poets right and i think yes i can imagine that but that's not the way i see it playing out in this particular period actually and it is like there is this kind of it still feels to me like a story about masculinity, oh, primarily, yeah. you know, and and that is is the story that that I am telling, and a and a crucial feature of that is the the kind of the misogyny of Orpheus and Ovid's myth. Although Ovid um, concludes the story in a way that I find quite affecting by narrating the experience of the Bacantes as they're hardened into oak. So they, they dismember Orpheus, throw his body in the river, 
and he floats away murmuring and the echoes of his song reverberate in the environment. But then the, the last thing that happens is Bacchus punishes the women by turning them into trees. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing that happens is they feel their bodies hardening into oak. And they, they then the word trial comes up again as they try to escape, but they can't. And so there is this sort of sense of the con con like the the misogyny feeding into an imp an experience of imprisonment that is accounted for, I guess, in the poem. Well, I'm sorry, what is accounted for? The, 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 the we say they pay price. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're also I would imagine I'd have to go look back at the passage. Um, it's probably also phallic because his branch is hardening. Yep. It, you know, it's, it's Daphne, it's probably also the Bacchae, uh, yes. Um, so the, uh, I have one other question that goes back to um, Suman's political question. Yeah. Um, which has to do with empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, whether it's a Roman Empire redux. Yeah, right. Or, or more proleptic than that. And, and mostly that comes through with Marlowe, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because he's so keenly attuned to the way in which Ovid's overtly sexual, sexual poetry is also a form of protest mm -hmm. against, you know, the, the rules, the laws of Augustus, the, the attempt to impose laws on the sexual body of Rome. Right. Um, so I just wondered, I, ne I never know quite how to think about this, yeah. um, but I, so I was thinking especially with, I, I love the chapter on Marlowe and I particularly like thinking about you know, my slack muse yeah that's an extraordinary it moment. is uh, but of course that's uh, that's Ovid's I can't get it up poem yeah right and and that people loved yeah. all the way through you know Rochester yeah. so that's the poem that's the Amores they one of the poems of the Amores they remember is the impotence poem yeah um so I don't know I'm I'm I'm, I think I'm probably linking two unconnected thoughts, but I was wondering whether you think this is a um, Marlowe's re-engagement with um, a protest right. against Roman imperial power or something I do, else. I do think so. I mean, I think that um, one, you know, one view of Orpheus is that this story mobilizes this structural opposition between the civilized and the barbarous that is so crucial to this kind of Roman imperial vision and this idea of a, of a race of warrior statesmen that can go civilize the barbarous. And, and the, the Orpheus story, if you take it in pieces and think, for example, only about his ability to draw animals and make savagery tame. It kind of can mobilize that idea that eloquence is a vehicle of empire. And, and you, um, English people, can go deploy it yeah. in, in other places and against other peoples. But the story in its fullness undercuts that, right? And, and so it only works if you freeze it in this one moment where he's surrounded by the animals at the apex of his power. And so what I see poets like Marlowe doing is dwelling on the other moments. Bacon too, like they're all focused on the moment the song fails. And so they may well be colonizers, right? They, you know, but they also have noticed, maybe even against their will, that this story isn't empowering them in the way that it's supposed to, <laughs> or the way, you know the way they've been taught it does. Yeah, and like I see that surfacing again and again and again. Um, There's a schoolmaster, John Brinsley, who, wrote in his preface yeah. to his translation of the Metamorphoses, said, "This can go help." us tame the wild and barbarous totally. people of Ireland. Yeah. So yeah. that's the, the message they were getting. But that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem like it was received. The difference between no. what they said and what yeah. students hear. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hmm. 
Roland, there's a, um, in the chat, there's a question at the very end by Susie Walford. Sure, um, let me ask Susie's question. Um, she says, uh, uh, she says, my, me, Roland's recent comment, uh, hold on, let me pull it up here if I can actually yeah. see it, um, touches on a comment I had about poetry versus music, which is that in performance, for example, Hades Town op, uh, Opera, Orpheus as a musician has to be the best singer we have ever heard. That's yeah. a lot for a production or a or a performer <laughs> to manage. Um, and the Hades Town composer then has uh, Orpheus as the struggling writer and musician who can't finish his song, but his song is not the most powerful in the play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is like where I started with this project, you know, where you're like, Orpheus song is so powerful. It could make trees move. And then I'm like, I want to hear it. <laughs> you know, what, like, what is it? What is this thing that would have this power, but that it can never actually be right. present. It can only be sort of pointed to. Right. And you see the animals move. And that's how you know um, that that force has been there. Right. Um, although that is the boldness, right, of Ovid, because all of book 10 is Orpheus singing. Yeah. So he, he writes the song uh, that is the most powerful that's ever been heard um, throughout book 10. And it is incredibly compulsive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to generations of poets who get ca like caught up in book 10 of the metamorphoses and I keep telling and retelling these stories and it's sort of propagating itself through them but it is like a t it is a real problem actually I haven't seen Hades Town um yet but it is like how do you how do you actually dramatize this you can't actually you'll fail right <laughs> it's, it's like uh you know, it's like the song of Colin Clout, which is a, a version of this in the Shepherd's Calendar. It can be covered by others. It can, yeah. it can be uh, turned into a dialogue. It can be commented on, but it can't be represented. And, yes, exactly. Yeah. I will note Tenacious D's version is to sing the tribute. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, we're in the last uh, uh, five or six minutes of this event. So let me return to one, to one more closing question from the audience. Um, I wonder, quoting the, uh, the audience member, I wonder if I could ask about Orpheus' song in the underworld. Rather than an attraction or a movement, it seems that the figures in the underworld stop what they're doing. Yes. When they're Orpheus is in the world, trees, animals, etc., yeah. move by him, but things in the underworld stop moving. Is there something in particular about the oh. underworld that changes rhetorics or music's effects? What a great question. And that will be our last question. Oh my gosh, I'm not gonna do it justice. It's true, they're frozen. They're frozen with stupefaction at the power of the song. And it's very different from the movement of the trees that happens above. Um, is it something about the underworld? What an interesting question. I think, I think Ovid doesn't really care about that part of the story, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he, he, I think it's, you know, he has, he says his lines, he says, love has conquered me, give me back Eurydice. I mean, he says other stuff too, that's a bad paraphrase, and wins her back. But I think he's actually much more caught up in the songs that happen after he's failed to bring her out of the underworld. And that kind of the, 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 the music that follows out of that failure that that is um, about like the life that happens afterward, but it's absolutely true. They don't move; they they freeze, um, and then they they um, give him what he's asked for. That's really good observation. It's not actually a claim about the difference between life and non-life, and the effect of eloquence. I mean, maybe that's really smart, hmm. right? that they cannot be enlivened, but they, can they can't be moved in the out. same way anymore. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. It, yeah. yeah, 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 it's beautiful. Good. Well, uh, we're approaching. I would, 
Go ahead. I was, I was going to add that that the movement between animation and petrification yeah. that just keeps going throughout the poem. Yeah. It, um, he's, he, I often call him a poet of the continuum and you get yeah. a sense of yeah. one side and the, and the other. And so from chaos to cities yeah. back to chaos, but petrification and it, then it occurs again in, yeah. when Pygmalion brings the statue yeah. to life. It's this like throb yeah. of, or this pulse mm -hmm. of one thing to another that alternates. <laughs> the Ovid beat. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're, we're uh, something else. Yeah. Let me cut somebody off. <laughs> no, okay. So uh, we're approaching uh, seven thirty p.m. in New York, uh, four thirty p.m. here in San Francisco. Uh, I want to conclude the event first of all by saying, Jenny, it's a tribute to your standing in the field, the number of people that are in the audience here, and the quality of the questions, and the um, the the sort of uh, a uh, group you've convened here around the publication of your book, The Trials of Orpheus. It's real tribute to you. And uh, so first of all, thank you, Jenny, for doing this. Thank you for the book on behalf of the audience. And thank you for uh, submitting to this, this uh, interesting uh, conversation. Then uh, Lynn Enterline and Sue Monseth, please take a bow. These were <laughs> fantastic presentations uh, that really served to illuminate the book. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure Jenny is, is, was really pleased to have the opportunity to engage with your comments and your questions. And finally, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, it's, a it's a fun thing for me to moonlight. I'm the director of the Stanford Humanities Center, so it's a fun thing for me to be able to moonlight as if I were the head of another humanities center. <laughs> and I'm going to conclude by saying, um, on behalf of the NYU Center for the Humanities, uh, thank you for joining us and please follow their events. Uh, Uli Bear was saying earlier tonight, they have two or three events per week online. Uh, and I'm sure they would love to uh, pick up some of the people in this audience as regular uh, viewers and participants. So thank you all for joining us and, and congratulations, Jenny. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.